past several years, there have been a number of, number of articles coming out about physician burnout. One article was in the New England Journal of Medicine, another article was in JAMA. And these two articles showed a striking reality, which is that depression among physicians is approaching 50%. That suicidal ideation is rising. The number of physicians who would tell their children to avoid becoming physicians is rising. The number of physicians who wish that they could escape medicine, but they don't see a way out, is rising. And that's a problem, because medicine is an astonishing privilege to show up in another person's life at a point where they're experiencing one of the deepest crises that they may face, and then to help them. How could that not be great? What's wrong? What are we missing in the way that we form physicians? The conflict that many physicians come up against is that we're trained to trust objective data, like laboratory results and numbers. But anyone who gets sick, including doctors when they get sick, anyone who gets sick is going to experience their illness not in terms of numbers or biology, but in terms of the things in their life that actually matter, that are being threatened by the potential for loss or by their hopes, by the questions that they may have never asked before about their worldview as they feel their body become frail. These are the kinds of things that frame our actual experience, even though the language of medicine is largely the language of biology. This says, you must clearly explain your problem. Um, I've felt like this more than once. Fortunately, I've made it 10 minutes into the talk without looking like this, I hope. But it's very difficult for patients and families often to communicate to the medical caregivers what it is that's wrong or what it is they need or what it is they care about, or what makes a difference in their decisions. And the two biggest issues that I see this becoming true for are, first of all, death. We find it incredibly hard to talk about death. This says, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've at least felt that until some of my patients taught me how to talk about it. And I certainly see many of my colleagues and my students who feel this when it comes time to have these sorts of difficult conversations. This is a quote by Woody Allen that I love because it captures a great deal of how people in America view death. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. <laughs> and I get that. When I think about myself, I strike myself as somebody who's much better off alive than dead. <laughs> and yet the fear of death and the unreflective approach to this fear is one of the things that drives many of our problems when we address the experience of illness, suffering, and dying in America. Pain is the second thing, and I'm using this as a placeholder for suffering, for loss in general. I had a patient recently, I, have, I do many pain consults, I had one recently a 15-year-old girl who had chronic pain, and often people with chronic pain are not believed entirely. They've learned techniques for managing their pain, techniques like using video games, staying very still in bed. But the resident will walk in and say, what's your pain? And they'll say, it's horrid. And then come and talk with me and say, I think she's faking. She was just laying quietly in bed playing video games. There's no way she's got horrible pain. And so I went to the girl and I said, okay, I need a different way for you to tell me what your pain is. That's the picture she drew. That's what pain looked like to her. She was an artist and she was able to use her art to help me understand the inside of her pain in a way that I simply um, would not have been able to understand it by listening to reports from the rest of the medical team. And we were able to do all sorts of things to help her with her pain after we finally understood it. Music